A young woman wakes up in a bathtub, stumbling on her way to the mirror. She gets ready, takes some pills, has another shot, and quickly rushes to the elevator. She then hurries through the restaurant room, running late for a chess match against the greatest player at the time, Borgov. As she stares at him, she remembers her past. Her mother was involved in a tragic car crash, and miraculously she, the nine-year-old Elizabeth emerged without a scratch. Left without any family, Beth is taken to an orphanage where she is warmly welcomed by the headmaster. The orphanage features a chapel, classroom, and dining room, with Beth's special place situated next to the loud bathroom. In reality, the headmaster always has her way. Beth undergoes a transformation, including a haircut and a change into the orphanage uniform. The headmaster burns Beth's dress with her name sewn in by her mother. The last stop is the vitamins, where the wild horse Jolene advises her to take the magic pills before sleep for a better effect. However, when Beth doesn't follow her advice, Beth quickly feels disoriented, not feeling any pain and Jolene quickly catches on. The food is atrocious, and the first night is sleepless for Beth, who remembers her father handing her mother the same colored pills. Her father promised that once he drove away, he wouldn't be coming back. Beth's mother, despite being PhD smart, had some problems. That was the last time Beth saw her father. Beth also excels in maths, finishing tasks ahead of everyone else and even surprising the teacher. Impressed, the teacher instructs her to go to the basement to clean the erasers. This marks Beth's first time in the basement, where she encounters the orphanage's janitor deeply immersed in a chess game. Intrigued, Beth watches, but when the janitor glances back at her, she quickly rushes away. During the next pill distribution, Jolene shows Beth how it's done and Beth succeeds in taking the pill before sleep. All Beth can think about is chess, imagining a board on the ceiling cast by the shadows. After a while, Beth witnesses one of the younger members being adopted. Jolene expresses that it doesn't feel fair, as most of the girls stay in the orphanage until they are old enough to live their own lives, because they are considered too old for adoption. Beth's life becomes a routine. She skips a choir class to go to the basement and asks the janitor, Shayabel, to teach her chess. However, he refuses to play with strangers, so she waddles away. That night, in addition to imagining the chessboard on the ceiling, Beth starts also envisioning the chess pieces. Beth confides in Jolene that she loves the feeling that the vitamins give her, but Jolene cautions her not to get used to it. The next day, while once again cleaning the erasers, Beth tries her luck with Shayabel again. However, Shayabel notes that girls do not play chess. Undeterred, Beth shares what she has learned from watching, revealing her understanding of how some pieces move. When she answers his question correctly, he finally agrees to play a game with her, stating it's now or never. They start the game, but it ends shortly with Shayabel checkmating her using the scholar's mate. He tells her that will be enough for today. That evening, after taking the vitamins, Beth envisions the game she played with Shayabel. She resets the board every time she loses, experimenting with different approaches, and getting ready for their next match. Once again, she skips choir to play against Shayabel. However, in their game, she loses her queen due to a rookie mistake. Despite her desire to continue playing, Shayabel emphasizes that when you lose your queen in such a manner, you resign, it's called sportsmanship. Beth becomes angry, calling Shayabel a cocksucker, before storming out. Unfortunately, the next time Beth attempts to play Shayabel, the door is locked tight. She resorts to playing chess on the ceiling in frustration, repeatedly checking the basement door, only to find it consistently locked. Beth becomes aware that she must have offended Shayabel in some way. She turns to Jolene, asking about the term sea sucker she heard from her. Jolene vaguely explains its meaning. In class, Beth reads an anatomy book, realizing her mistake. When she tries the basement door again, this time it's open. Without a single word exchanged, Shayabel invites her to play. They engage in the end game, and she secures her first win over Shayabel. Following this victory, Shayabel begins teaching her new chess moves, including the Sicilian defense. As time unfolds, Beth immerses herself more deeply in her chess journey with Shayabel. Regularly collecting her pills, she absorbs his teachings on new variations and openings. Beth's dedication becomes so intense that, at times, the erasers remain absent for the entire lesson. During the nights, she revisits Shayabel's lessons and explores beyond them, fueled by her pills. For the first time, Shayabel lets Beth play as white, a privilege she hadn't been granted before. When she questions the reason behind this change, Shayabel, a man of few words, says play. Despite this, he succumbs to defeat once again, presenting Beth with a book on modern openings. In a rare and heartfelt admission, he acknowledges her as an astounding chess player. In her classes, Beth's mind is consumed by thoughts of chess openings. When she goes to play Shayabel, she encounters Gans, a member of the chess club, who proposes a game. Getting to play the white pieces, Beth captures Shayabel's attention. As the game unfolds, Gans initially appears confident, 
but with one misstep, Beth astounds him by declaring checkmate in three moves, swiftly concluding the game. Gans knows that her chess games have been limited to Sundays with Shayabel, she emphasizes that most of her play occurs in her mind. Despite Gans presenting her with a gift, Beth forces a smile, expresses gratitude, and promptly requests another game. Beth demonstrates her extraordinary skill by playing Shayabel and Gans simultaneously. After achieving checkmate against Shayabel, she smoothly transitions to playing Gans, relying solely on her memory. With a concise series of moves, she checkmates Gans as well. Recognizing her remarkable talent, Gans is so impressed that he requests to take her photo, a moment captured alongside Shayabel. Walking up the stairs, she quickly disposes of the doll. During a movie on etiquette, Beth is summoned to the headmaster's office. It appears that Gans has disclosed Beth's exceptional chess talent to the headmaster, who is considering allowing her to play against high school chess players. Initially hesitant, the headmaster is persuaded by Gans, with Beth's support. However, as Gans departs, the headmaster imposes a ban on Beth's visits to the basement, preventing her from playing chess with Shayabel. During the pill distribution, Beth is denied the green pill due to a new state law prohibiting tranquilizers for children, despite a jar full of them. Facing the challenge of her supply running out and relying on the pills to play chess in her mind, Beth has to figure out how to get those pills. She confides in Jolene about the pills, and Jolene observes Beth's withdrawal symptoms, telling her she's better off without them. As promised, Gans arrives, and Beth is on edge. Before she leaves, Jolene hands her a few pills, understanding that Beth needs them. It's Beth's first time in a new environment in a long time. There are dozens of chess boards on the tables, and she will play all simultaneously. Just as the bell rings, the room is filled with chess players eager to prove that they are better than the little prodigy. However, as Beth starts to play, the room begins to fill with observers, witnessing her effortlessly checkmate every single student. She recounts the story of how easy and satisfying it was to Shayabel, who then wears a concerned expression. During lunch, she rudely asks Jolene for pills, even just one, but Jolene doesn't want to hear about the pills. Beth is fixated on them. While Shayabel is out, she grabs a screwdriver. During a movie, she sneaks out on the pretense of going to the bathroom and starts to unscrew the lock, worried that at any moment she might be caught. She manages to undo the lock and opens the window slowly. Using a chair to climb in and make as little sound as possible, she finally gets her hands on the cookie jar. But instead of just stuffing her pockets, she starts to stuff herself and then her pockets. Meanwhile, the movie has ended. Just as she climbs out, with the jar in her hands, the headmaster, along with the whole class, is there to witness her breaking the jar and falling unconscious. After the incident, Jolene tells Beth how funny she looked up on that stool while being yelled at. Fortunately, she's okay. Walking down the hallway, Beth notices Shayabel, explaining to him that they forbid her from playing with him and asking for his help, but Shayabel doesn't respond. She just wanted to play more with him. A long time later, Jolene is scolded for still being in bed. She lights her cigarette and wakes up Beth. Both of them see new foster parents arrive, and the mother looks at Beth with a smile, creeping her out. Beth walks downstairs, and it turns out the couple is here to see her. Even though Beth is now 15, the headmaster lies about her age, saying she's 13, praising her schoolwork and everything to the couple. The mother is overjoyed, but the father doesn't care. That evening, Beth packs her things, unable to find her book on Sicilian defense she got from Shayabel. Jolene has no idea about it, she doesn't need a book, just say yes sir, and yes ma'am, and she will be just fine. Beth apologizes for Jolene never getting adopted, and she says it's fine, but deep down, it isn't. Beth's morning adoption evokes mixed emotions. Shayabel bids her farewell. Alma, her adoptive mother, is joyous for an older child, while Alston, the father, seems less enthused about the new addition. Finally, home sweet home. Beth steps into her room, and the overwhelming thought hits her, this is all mine? Having lived in a trailer, and then an orphanage, having a room to herself feels like a dream come true. The next morning, Alston unexpectedly departs on a two-week business trip, leaving Beth and Alma to spend time together. During this time, Beth discovers Alma's talent for playing the piano and learns about the tragic loss of Alma's child in an accident. It's the first day of school, a new and unfamiliar environment for Beth. In the first lesson, already the girls are gossiping about Beth and her poor choice of fashion, leaving Beth feeling out of place even at lunch. Sitting alone, Beth is joined by a girl. Beth inquires about the existence of a chess club. Unfortunately, there is no chess club, but the school does have various social clubs for girls, such as the Apple Pie Club. Nothing Beth is really interested in. Alston returns sooner than expected, showing little affection toward Alma. Noting that Beth is still wearing her old clothes, they decide to go shopping. Alma opts for discounted second-hand clothes for Beth, considering both growth room and budget constraints. The sales room looks deserted. Beth's sole interest, 
Chess, remains unacknowledged by Alma. In her new clothes at school, Beth faces public ridicule for her fashion choices. While in the library searching for chess books, she stumbles upon a book in the last row. Amidst this, she observes a couple making out, and although the girl notices her, she doesn't pay much attention. At home, eager to replay some chess matches from the book she found, Beth's plans are interrupted when Alma asks her to buy cigarettes. At the store, Beth notices a chess review magazine and scrolls through it, but the store owner tells her to read the sign. Beth can't afford the magazine, but wants it badly. She buys a newspaper and swindles the chess review magazine, throwing the newspaper out. Back home, Alma reveals their financial struggles, cutting Beth's meager allowance, and also, Alston won't be coming home soon. When Beth proposes getting a job to participate in a chess tournament, Alma angrily dismisses it as not an option. Beth writes a letter to Mr. Shayabel, requesting a $5 entry fee for a chess tournament, promising to pay him $10 if she wins any prize. Back home, Alma, sick with a virus, sends Beth to get her prescription. At the shop, Beth is confronted with her favorite childhood pills. When she gives the pills to Alma, it's only half full, the other half she took for herself. Beth cuts her bed's linen and finally is able to play ceiling chess again. After some time, Beth finally stands up to Margaret, her bully. She receives a reply from Mr. Shayabel. As always, he is a man of few words and sends her just the $5. To prepare for it, she gets another refill on the pills, this time for herself. At home, she reveals that she signed up for the tournament. Alma dismisses it, suggesting it would be better to join a dance class or something, still refusing to listen to Beth's true feelings. At Henry Clay High, Beth finally signs up for the tournament, getting dismissed by the two brothers who are sure she will lose. Beth doesn't care, she pays the entry fee and enters, finally her time to prove her worth. She checks the matchups and asks if they are matched at random. The matching is based on rating, and then winners play winners, and losers play losers. This is the first time Beth gets flustered by a guy. Beth's first opponent is a girl, she explains the rules about the clock and keeping a record of their moves. They start the game, but it ends relatively quickly, surprising even the brothers. She goes back to watch the top boards play. It's Beltic versus Cullen, with Beltic, the younger one and a state champion, clearly bothered by Beth's loud voice. Cullen offers a draw, but Beltic clearly has an upper hand and wins. Beth Harmon's next match is versus Cook, and as he thinks he does a good play with a smug face, Beth destroys all his dreams with her next move, winning the match. On the first day she won all four games, going undefeated. The next day, looking at the matchups, Beth is irritated that she isn't matched with the best. The brothers tell her she should consider herself lucky, but she wants to play Beltic, and she will, if she wins her next three games. However, they doubt that it will happen. Her next game is against Towns, the guy she has been silently stalking throughout the tournament. Amazed by him, they engage in a long and intense match, drawing a small group of spectators. Ultimately, Beth wins the game, barely containing her excitement to play Towns. However, something unexpected happens. Beth rushes to the bathroom, groaning from pain. Her first opponent walks in, and Beth admits it's her first time. The girl provides her with pads, but Beth opts for a different approach. She is unable to focus on her next game, what is even more irritating, her opponent combs his hair before every move. When Beth gets home, she tells Alma about her period. Alma tells her to get what she needs from her room, also to grab her pills. When Beth enters the master bedroom, it's chaos, all the clothes and things are everywhere. She wonders if something is wrong. Turns out Alston has a lover, and he won't be returning. Beth wonders if she has to go back to the orphanage, but she doesn't have to if they lie about it. Alma might not be a good wife, but she promises to become a good mother, setting Beth's mind at ease. Same night, Beth sees her real mother in the reflection, remembering her last words, close your eyes. The next morning, it's finally the grand final, Beth versus Beltic. Beltic is late, sure that this game is going to be a breeze. He even disrespectfully yawns in front of Beth, infuriating her. Throughout the whole game, he doesn't take Beth seriously. The game isn't easy for Beth either. She excuses herself and takes her magic pill in the bathroom, motivating herself to win against the annoying Beltic and starting to see the game clearer. When Beth comes back, with two decisive moves, she takes control over the game, cornering Beltic and making him lose his cool. In a few more moves, the game is basically decided, but Beltic refuses to give up. They do a few more moves before Beltic finally surrenders. Beth is in the newspaper, becoming the Kentucky champion in chess and winning $100. Alma didn't think people could make money playing chess, but Beth reveals that tournaments pay even in thousands. She can finally afford a chessboard and all the books her heart desires, even the most fashionable clothes. Just as Beth is about to use her new chessboard, Alma calls her. 
she scrolled through a chess magazine, noticing a tournament in Cincinnati with the first place paying $500. She offers to write a medical note excusing her from school, and Beth excitedly promises that she will win the tournament. Finally in Cincinnati, the girls are pleased with their room, but Beth's focus is on the tournament. Her participation is immediately recognized due to her victory in the Kentucky Championship. On her way to her game, she encounters a guy asking everyone about their move in a specific chess situation. Beth confidently responds that she would take the pawn, assuming it's the move everyone thinks is correct. However, she soon realizes it's the wrong move, leading to embarrassment and allowing the guy, Benny, to portray himself as the smartest one in the room. He isn't playing today, but Beth can't wait to whoop his ass. In her first match, Beth's opponent is aware of her reputation. It's an easy win for her. In her room, slightly annoyed by her mother's loud enjoyment, Beth reviews her games, searching for weaknesses, only to find none. Beth effortlessly wins the semi-final game. The twins, who initially signed her up for her first game in Kentucky and whom she met yesterday, congratulate her, acknowledging her formidable skills. Alma seizes the opportunity to invite herself to dinner with the boys, finding it difficult to decide which one is more handsome. They discuss the US Open, recognizing that winning it would open numerous doors for Beth. While victory would grant her the opportunity to play in Europe, her ultimate goal is Russia, home to the best chess players of the last two decades. The final match arrives, and unsurprisingly, Beth effortlessly defeats her formidable opponent. After the game, Alma reviews their finances and informs Beth that she made $300 after deducting all expenses. Alma contemplates becoming Beth's agent for a 10% cut, but Beth negotiates for a 15% share, deepening their bond. As Beth gains momentum, her achievements lead to a publication in the weekly chess magazine. Alma, recognizing the potential for easy money in chess, continues to fabricate excuses to keep Beth away from school, allowing her to participate in tournaments across the United States. The girls even celebrate Christmas on a plane, marking it as Beth's best Christmas yet and offering her a taste of her first Gibson. During a relaxing pedicure, Beth delves into learning more about the Russian champion, contemplating the idea of learning the language as it would come in handy. During a home interview, Beth Harmon finds herself subjected to questions that predominantly focus on her being a female player in a male-dominated chess world. Unfazed, Beth dismisses the notion of intimidation, emphasizing that she learned the game from Mr. Shayabel in an orphanage. The interviewer takes an insensitive turn, questioning whether she sees the king as a father figure, to which Beth dismisses, as chess pieces being just that, pieces. The line of inquiry then shifts towards Beth's talent, insinuating potential deficiencies or madness. Alma intervenes, putting an end to the intrusive questioning. The article about Beth made her famous, especially for being a girl in chess. She gained admirers and became a celebrity prodigy. Meanwhile, Alma's persistent cough raises concerns, possibly due to her drinking habits, but Alma refuses to admit it. Beth Harmon receives an unexpected invitation from Margaret, the school's idol and former bully, to join an exclusive club for a Friday night hangout. Eager to embrace the opportunity for popularity, Beth dons her most beautiful dress and attends the sleepover. However, the atmosphere quickly turns uncomfortable as she faces a barrage of questions, and the visibly annoyed Margaret even asks Beth about boys, subtly embarrassing her. Feeling out of place during a singing session, Beth realizes this isn't the path she wants to follow. Spotting a bar, she swiftly makes her exit, grabbing a bottle on her way out. Turning to her magic pills, she begins to mix them with vodka, slowly adding a new addiction to her existing struggles. In Las Vegas, 1966, on her way to another significant chess competition, the US Open, Beth meets Towns, her crush from the first chess tournament she played in Kentucky. This time, Towns isn't playing, he is working as a writer for the Chess Review magazine. Beth, now more confident, is glad to see him. Since Towns works for multiple magazines, he offers to do an interview on Beth for one of them, and she gladly agrees, heading to his room. This presents the chance Beth has longed for, she is ready for her first male experience. He asks Beth to make herself comfortable while he takes her pictures. She proves to be a natural in front of the camera. As she sits near the chessboard, Beth starts to give Towns a certain look, making him a bit uncomfortable. Nevertheless, he comments on how she's grown up and become good-looking. Towns moves closer to Beth, not to take a picture but to stare at her intensely, slowly leaning in. Their moment however, is abruptly interrupted by Towns' roommate, raising a quick realization for Beth that Towns is actually gay, crushing all of her dreams in an instant. In her room, Alma observes Beth's disappointment and offers her a beer. Beth quickly chugs it down, reminiscing about Towns, and requests another. Despite knowing she shouldn't, Alma allows it. This marks the beginning of a gradual habit for Beth. Beth recounts her chess games from the next day to Alma. Her first match was against a guy from Oklahoma, which concluded in just a few dozen moves. 
Although she finishes her matches quickly, everyone is aware of Beth's late game weakness. The one competitor she is eyeing to beat is Benny, the US champion, who always attracts a crowd. However, Beth is not afraid of him. Her true fear is the Russian player, Borgov. After one of the games, she has a brief conversation with Benny. He mentions watching her game against Beltic and points out a mistake she made, suggesting that she shouldn't have castled. This intrigues Beth, and even though she disagrees, Benny encourages her to set up the board and play it out, emphasizing the mistake once again. Beth doesn't waste a moment and sets up the chessboard to replay the game. She confides in Alma that Beltic could have beaten her if he had noticed the mistake Benny pointed out. This realization puts Beth on edge, she's frustrated that Benny, who read about it in a magazine, instantly spotted a flaw in her game that she didn't even see. To cope with the stress, Beth takes her magic pill before going to bed. The next day brings the finalist game, Beth vs Benny. The match begins with Beth playing several different openings in her head before making her first move. Throughout the game, Beth is on edge, feeling as if Benny can see every move she plans. She enters the game with a perfect score, while Benny has two draws, so a draw would secure her the title. However, Beth desires a win to prove to Benny that her playstyle is effective, even though he doubted it. Unexpectedly, Benny captures her center pawn, leading to a forced exchange of queens. Beth is caught off guard, and soon she finds herself cornered in a brutal defeat, experiencing what she often inflicted on others. In the face of defeat, she recalls Mr. Shayabel's words, you resign now. It's a bitter acknowledgement of her loss. Despite the co-champion status based on the score, Beth is deeply stung by this defeat. Alma tries to comfort her, but Beth becomes defensive, asserting that Alma knows nothing about chess. On her way out, Towns approaches Beth, apologizing to her, knowing how badly she wanted to beat Benny, she will get another shot, but that doesn't matter now. In car, Beth takes Alma's hand, understanding that she's the only person by her side. Beth attracts the attention of a random guy who subtly invites her to his place for a session of getting high. Interestingly, her newfound friend expresses a disdain for capitalist slaves while aspiring to get rich, what an irony. Just as Beth thinks it's her time to dip and goes to call a cab, the flickering candlelight presents her with the chance to explore something she's always considered an enigma. Beth calls her mom to tell her she won't be home tonight. However, instead of a special someone, the encounter turns out to be an utter disappointment from every angle. Waking up in the morning, Beth finds the entire house in disarray, accompanied by a note saying that everyone has left and she can stay as long as she likes. Taking full advantage of the situation, Beth, with her morning beer in hand, engages in a thorough cleaning session and indulges in some self-enjoyment, perhaps a bit too much. She assures Alma that she's doing well and won't be returning home today, concluding with the famous last words, I won't get pregnant. Losing to Benny and becoming US Open co-champion really did a number on Beth. Anyway, it didn't stop her from graduating high school. As a graduation gift, Alma presents Beth with a belova, a token of affection that Beth truly appreciates. Putting an end to her recent streak of tantrums, Beth composes herself and heads off to a chess tournament in Mexico. During the flight, Alma opens up to Beth about having a pen pal, named Manuel from Mexico, with whom she has been exchanging letters since high school, even during her marriage. Alma is excited as Manuel is meeting them at the airport, marking their first in-person encounter. However, Beth isn't particularly thrilled seeing the sleazy Mexican salesman. In the ensuing week, Alma revels in the company of Manuel, and Beth grows increasingly annoyed by Alma's discussions about him. Despite Beth's attempts to focus on studying her endgame chess for two challenging matches the next day, Alma persuades her to take a day off to unwind and explore the city. While strolling at the zoo, memories of Mr. Shayabel's words resurface in Beth's mind, she has a gift, but there is always a cost. Yet, the nine-year-old Beth didn't pay much attention to such advice. Observing Borgov with his family and KGB agents at the zoo, Beth realizes she can't afford to take any time off. Alma returns late at night, coughing persistently, convinced she caught a virus and won't be able to watch Beth's matches. The next day, the 17-year-old chess prodigy makes headlines, having demolished her opponent in 31 moves. Despite her success, Alma, engrossed in her time with the Mexican salesman, fails to offer support. Feeling neglected, Beth decides to indulge in her own enjoyment, going for a swim and playing cards with the twins. Beth's subsequent chess matches conclude swiftly, her dominating victories leaving opponents speechless. Beth, after briefly watching Borgov play, decides not to stay until the end. Instead, she seeks out Alma in their hotel room, finding her moping on the balcony. The Mexican salesman has left to reunite with his family, marking an end to their so-called relationship. The following day, Beth faces a challenging match against a young Russian boy named Georgie. The game, unfolding unexpectedly, extends for five hours, and Georgie suggests postponing it until the next day. 
Annoyed by the proposal, Beth seals her next move and attempts to leave swiftly, opting to continue analyzing and playing the game from the comfort of the bathtub. However, she is interrupted by Alma's moans, signaling her worsening condition. The next day, the game resumes. Beth, having explored all possible variations, already knows her next move for any strategy Georgie might employ. Instead of sitting at the board, she walks around, staring Georgie down menacingly from the hallway. Her aim is to emphasize to Georgie that postponing the game was a futile exercise, the outcome was predetermined. Beth struggles to conceal her annoyance at playing a game that's essentially decided. However, as she makes her final move, Georgie recognizes the inevitable, and resigns in the old way. Curious, Beth asks Georgie when he started playing chess. He reveals that he began at the age of 4, became a district champion at 7, and confidently declares his goal to be the world champion in 3 years. Beth however, questions what comes after achieving that title. Perplexed, Georgie doesn't grasp the concept. Beth points out that he's the best opponent she's ever faced. As she walks away, Georgie mutters to himself, until you play Borgov. In the lobby, Beth discovers Alma playing the piano. Despite her stage fright, Alma appears to be enjoying herself. As the girls plan to grab a bite at a cafe, they realize that the next match is against Borgov. To prepare, they decide to eat in the room. The next day, Beth takes the elevator downstairs, Encountering Borgov accompanied by the second and third ranked chess players in Russia. They express the urgency of defeating Beth before she becomes too formidable. Borgov emphasizes that losing is not an option for Beth, considering her orphaned background, but goes quiet when he notices Beth in the back. Borgov is always surrounded by his chess colleagues and KGB agents, ensuring he remains in check and doesn't escape. The big match has finally arrived. Beth has been waiting for so long to test her skills against the best player in the world. Borgov plays the most common opening for white, and Beth usually plays Sicilian against it, but the narrator notes that Borgov is titled the master of Sicilian. In the room, Alma still prepares to watch the match, but something on her skin catches her attention. Instead of continuing to play Sicilian, Beth opts to play out of her comfort zone and play a rare opening, hoping to catch Borgov off guard. The thing in chess is that white always has the advantage because of the first move. Theoretically, if you play right, black can never win. As the game goes on, Beth finds herself cornered, she knows there is no escaping it, she is about to lose. She glances at the board one more time, and then back at Borgov, seeing Mr. Shayabel, telling her that he she has to resign. With a childing move, she resigns. Back at her room, she goes on a tantrum about how she didn't expect Borgov to know her strategy, as no one really plays it. It threw her off and Borgov knew it. The game was over the moment Beth played an opening she isn't familiar with herself, and it was an uphill battle the entire time. Beth hates how every move Borgov made, was so obvious and unimaginative, just like in the books. Beth is glad Alma didn't see it, but just as she touches Alma's leg, Beth realizes something. She turns on the light. Alma is dead. The doctor says that her mother died from hepatitis. To cope, she asks for a prescription for her magic pills, but it turns out you don't need a prescription for it in Mexico. The hotel manager says that they will help her any way possible, and notes that the bill will be taken care of, a very large bill, especially for the alcohol. For some reason Beth notes that Alma did mention something about the quality of tequila. Beth writes down her father's name, saying that she needs to find him. Alston calls that evening and Beth tells him that Alma died this morning. He has no will to do anything about it, and just tells Beth to take care of it. She doesn't even know where to bury her, so he gives her notes on who to call and what to do, even mentioning that the house is Beth's, if she can do this for him. There is nothing he can do for her really. Now Beth is all alone, losing the last person that was by her side. The next day she grabs a bottle of her magic pills and is on her way home, with her mother in a casket, downing a few margaritas for her mother. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more videos like this.